are listening to In Pursuit of Development with Dan Bannock. My guest today is one of the world's most influential philosophers. He has written several path-breaking books and is one of the intellectual founders of the modern animal rights and effective altruism movements, in addition to making important contributions to the development of bioethics. Peter Singer is the Ira W. D. Camp Professor of Bioethics at Princeton University. In this conversation, Peter and I discuss several of his books, including Animal Liberation, The Expanding Circle, Ethics and Sociobiology, The Most Good You Can Do, Why Vegan Eating Ethically, and The Life You Can Save, How to Do Your Part to End World Poverty. We began by discussing what a morally good life looks like and why we must not just consider suffering in relation to humans, but also animals. Thereafter, we focused on how and why we should eat ethically and what effective altruism means. In the final section, we discussed the work of an organization Peter co-founded, The Life You Can Save, which is based on his book of the same name. This organization aims to spread Peter's ideas about why we should be doing much more to improve the lives of people living in extreme poverty and how we can best do this. My team and I are absolutely thrilled to see the fantastic response to season three of the show. Please keep sending us your questions, comments, and suggestions, and tell your friends and colleagues about the show. Thank you. Peter, I'm a huge fan of your work. I'm so thrilled to see you today. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Dan. It's good to be talking to you. The first question I have for you is, what constitutes a morally good life? Because there's been quite a lot of focus on this, and I'm interested in understanding how does this morally good life, as you see it, perhaps differ from other understandings, say, of what a good life should be? So when I'm asked about what a morally good life is, I suggest that it's one that considers the impact of everything that we do or don't do on all of those who are affected by those decisions. And that includes, as I say, those who we could have affected, perhaps positively, if we'd done something, even if we hadn't done it. So another way of thinking about this is to to use a phrase from the late 19th century utilitarian philosopher Henry Sidgwick, who talked about taking the point of view of the universe. It's a phrase that I and a co-author have used for a book about Sidgwick's ethics, uh, for the title of that book. And, you know, if you think of the idea of taking the point of view of the universe, I don't actually believe, and I don't think Sidgwick believed that the universe really has a point of view, but we can imagine looking at everything and saying, have I done what I would want to be done if I were taking the point of view of the universe, that is, considering all of those beings in the universe. Now, if there are beings that we don't know about extra, you know, on other planets and so on, we we can't affect them at the moment anyway. But all of those we can affect on this planet, whether human or non-human, we ought to be taking their interests into account. And to me, that's crucial for living an ethical life. And of course, it does differ from those who would say an ethical life consists in doing your roles well. So you're uh, a parent, you're um, an employee, you're a friend. And so it's really important to be a good parent, uh, a good employee and a good friend. And you know, I don't deny that those things are important. They're obviously things where you can make a big difference to people. But I don't want to stop there. I want to include the others, the strangers, very large numbers of strangers, where often we can make a bigger difference to their lives than we can to the lives of our friends. So are we then talking about doing the greatest good as being, say, the measure of good or ethical behavior? I'm thinking of a Jeremy Bentham, you know, the greatest happiness of the greatest number, that is the measure of right and wrong, or John Stuart Mill, that acts that produce pleasure or prevent pain, those are the most desirable. 
It seems to me that in much of your work, it is about minimizing suffering that is key, right? So mm -hmm. pleasure, happiness, suffering should be seen together that by helping others, we can derive some pleasure and happiness and thereby also reduce the suffering of those we are helping. Yes, that's right. I'm certainly in that tradition of, of Bentham and Mill, and I've already mentioned Sidgwick. I think we need to be careful about this phrase, the greatest happiness of the greatest number. And, and Bentham himself recognized, you know, after he'd used it, that maybe it wasn't the ideal tagline for utilitarianism, because it leads people to think that if you do something that is in the interests of 51%, then that must be the right thing to do, because you've made the greatest number happier. But of course, you might have made the 51% the slightly happier and made the 49% utterly miserable. Or maybe you've even made 99% slightly happier, but 1% uh, really so much, more, so much more badly off that it was the wrong thing to do, that it, it would have been better not to do that. So you have to take into account numbers. Numbers do matter. But you also have to take into account how big a difference you're making to the lives of others. Uh, and I think particularly when we think about suffering, people who are suffering seriously have to get a lot of weight because that is a, where we can make a, a huge difference in their lives if we can relieve their suffering. Often a bigger difference than we can make when people are not suffering, not particularly happy, but living you know, okay. And it's, it's a lot harder to make them significantly happier usually. But this uh, focus on suffering, Peter, it also applies to animals. We can't just think about suffering in relation to us humans. And in your influential book, you have so many influential books, but the one from 1975, Animal Liberation, you of course argue that there's no reason not to apply the greatest good principle to also animals, right? So, so it, isn't, it isn't about intelligence, it is about pain. And in that context, I was just thinking about the climate change discourse, there's now increased focus on, say, the kind of ethical behavior that we should be practicing in terms of eating ethically. And in this context, of course, some of the arguments you made in 1975 and subsequently have become even more relevant in terms of the argument for vegetarianism, the fact that you, I think, and your wife stopped eating meat in 1971. How do you see that discourse in terms of not necessarily animal rights, but this focus on suffering also in relation to animals, that seems to be very much part of the current discourse on climate change as I see it. Yes, I think that's true. When I, when my wife and I, as you say, became vegetarians in, in 1971, we were thinking about the effect on animals. It was after we had discovered that many animals had been taken indoors and closely confined in factory farms, that they were not living sort of natural lives suitable for their natures out on the fields anymore. And uh, we thought that that was quite wrong to ignore their interests and we didn't need to eat them. So we stopped eating them and that was concern for the animals. I suppose there was some awareness that we had then after reading uh, Francis Moore Lappe's book, uh, Diet for a Small Planet, which also came out around that time, that, uh, that it was inefficient anyway to raise animals and feed them on grain or soybeans, that this was wasting a lot of food and therefore a lot of good agricultural land and that the planet could feed its population better and preserve the environment better if we didn't eat meat. But uh, we had no idea about climate change. I only became aware of climate change, I think, in 1984 when I spent a year at the University of Colorado in, uh, in Boulder and the uh, National Center for Atmospheric Research uh, was there. And I learned from my then colleague and uh, friend, Dale Jamison, about uh, climate change. He was the first philosopher I met who was, got interested in climate change. But of course, yes, uh, animals, particularly ruminants, give out a lot of methane, and that contributes to climate change as well. So that's another major reason for not eating meat. And just in the last couple of years, I think, we've recognized the seriousness of pandemics and how much uh, damage they can do. And many people have warned us that uh, most of the dangerous viruses, including the coronaviruses, come to us from animals. And uh, some people have said, if, if you want to 
if you really wanted to set out to breed new viruses, you would take 20,000 animals, crowd them together in a single shed where they were all very stressed, um, and then send workers to go among them. And of course, that's exactly what factory farms are. And we have already had viruses coming out of factory farms, not totally lethal ones, fortunately, or else not very contagious ones. But, you know, if we want to reduce the risks of having a, a pandemic that's as contagious as, as Omicron, but much more deadly, uh, then that's another reason for getting rid of factory farms. So, so you did write that book in 2020 when the pandemic started, Why Vegan Eating Ethically, and, and some of these issues you discussed there. I'm also thinking about it's not just really about meat, is it? It's also fruits and vegetables. There's so much attention now on procuring these things locally, vegetables or fruits that don't consume too much water, that um, there should be a focus on fair trade. What, what are your thoughts there beyond meat? Well, I think that those are all things that are, are worth considering, but I, we do have to look at the, the relevant facts. Eating locally in itself is good, but not always, right? Suppose that you want to eat locally, but you still want to eat uh, tomatoes. Let's say this will depend where you're living, but you're living in Norway, I understand at the moment. So suppose, suppose you, you, you want to eat tomatoes in June, let's say, right? So I, I assume that tomatoes are not going to ripen naturally in the sunshine in, in Norway by June. <laughs> no. So if you did get local tomatoes, they would have to come from a greenhouse that would have had to be heated for the previous three months or something so the tomatoes could grow. And heating that greenhouse would probably use more fossil fuel than transporting tomatoes from, let's say, the south of Spain where they could have been ripened in the sunshine. So it's, it's not going to always be better to eat locally. I think you need to think about what am I eating? Is it seasonal? If it's not seasonal, do I need to eat it? Or where does it come from? How far does it travel? Um, and another factor is in terms of, you, you mentioned fair trade. I think we do want to buy foods from countries that can grow them more efficiently than we can and at lower cost than we can. We don't want to fly them to us because that's generally pretty uh, costly in, in terms of fossil fuel and emissions. But if it's something that can be shipped, say, you know, coffee can be shipped while it's green before it's roasted, it travels fine, products like rice. So I don't see, I'm, I'm, I'm in Australia now. There is a small amount of Australian coffee produced. I didn't know. <laughs> but we don't have ideal conditions for growing coffee, right? It, 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 likes, it, it grows better at a high altitude. So I think it's perfectly fine to import your coffee from Brazil or from Kenya or wherever it might come from. And similarly, you know, rice from Bangladesh, for example, um, helps support the economy there, can come on a ship. I don't have a problem with, with buying that either even though Australia does produce rice. So I think, I think you need to think individually. Where, what sort of impacts am I having and, and how to weigh them up? And uh, we do want to help countries with lower income, but we do want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions as well. It seems to me, Peter, that it's getting very difficult these days to make these decisions to lead a morally good life because, well, on the one hand, you could say, you know, we have access to information, tons of information, perhaps a bit too much. And it isn't always easy for an individual to weigh the, the merits of these different choices that we make, right? So fair trade by paying good wages to people producing coffee in Colombia is good. But as you were pointing, flying it all the way to Norway is perhaps not so good. So how do you see these trade-offs that we must make on a daily basis while we drink our coffee, read the papers, and we figure out what it means to lead a morally good life? Yes, I mean, you, you don't want to have to be doing complex calculations every time you buy some food. So I think get some, get some basic principles straight and generally stick to them, of course, Keep alert for new developments, new things that are happening. They can change your, your habits, but it's not something that you want to calculate uh, all the time. So as I say, try to avoid food that's been flown long distances, but not necessarily food that's been shipped long distances because you know, putting coffee on a ship is, is quite efficient. You can get a lot of coffee um, traveling. It takes longer, but it doesn't use so much fossil fuel as 
flying it over. And then, of course, as I've already said, try to avoid animal products, especially factory farm products, for a whole variety of reasons, and eat seasonally when you can. And you know, there's something quite enjoyable about that. I think we've, we've got to the sense that you feel, oh, I need to have tomatoes all year round. But there was more excitement in a way when, oh, we're getting, we're getting the first tomatoes. It's so long since I've had a tomato. That's really great. So there are different decisions that people will make in terms of what's more important for them and what isn't. But think about, think about the impact you're having on animals. Think about the impact you're having on, on the climate. Think about what impact you're having on public health. All of those things, I think, come into that decision. Peter, let's move to discussing effective altruism as an idea. And I want to actually begin by referring to a book that you published, I think, in 1981, The Expanding Circle, where you define altruism as a genetically based drive to protect one's kin and community members. But this has now developed into a consciously chosen ethic with an expanding circle of moral concern. I'm interested, Peter, in understanding your views on altruism, how you think these ideas related to altruism have evolved since you published that 1981 book, and how you think altruism as a concept idea is perceived and practiced today. I think there have been some changes in my thought, although I would still agree with what you just quoted or summarized. I do think that we have a genetic basis for altruism, but that genetic basis is relatively limited in the circle of beings to whom we are likely to show altruism. They're, they're going to be firstly family and our close kin, and then they're going to be members of our relatively small group of people who we recognize that we have long-term relationships with, and particularly that we have mutually beneficial relationships with, with reciprocity. So for our ancestors, that was probably a group of 100 to 150 people. That was the sort of tribal society that humans appear to have lived in for a long part of our evolutionary history. And so we're well adapted to that, to those kinds of numbers. But we're not well adapted to the idea that we might be altruistic towards strangers who we don't even see as individuals because they're they're far from us. And we're not really well adapted to altruism towards non-human animals. Although when we domesticated animals like dogs and had them around, then perhaps we did extend our altruistic feelings towards them. It's at that point, in my view, that the capacity to reason comes in. And this goes back to what I was saying before about taking the point of view of the universe. So we can see and we have this innate idea that uh, we, we are aware of how people in this small group feel and we have empathy with them when they suffer. We don't want to see them suffering. And then as we develop reasoning capacities, we start to be able to see that other people who are not part of that group are in important ways like them. That is, that they have the capacity to suffer too and that it matters just as much to them if someone they love is killed, for example, um, as it would matter to us or to other members of our family. And so we start to be able to say, well, that's not a good thing to do. If, if we don't need to do it, you know, if we uh, are not fighting a war against people, we're not doing it in self-defense or anything like that, but you know, it's, it's not a good thing to harm others. Now, that's not necessarily a dominant attitude. We've clearly seen people who've gone out directly to, to dominate and uh, kill and, and rape uh, strangers and so on. So th this is not the only aspect of our biological nature that is there, but it is there and it enables us to take that broader point of view and to expand the circle. And I think we've done that over the last few hundred years, perhaps understanding more about strangers when we developed abilities to learn about them through the invention of the printing press, for example, and even more now through the internet and television and so on. 
So I think that helps us to stretch these ideas and then we can start thinking about including all human beings initially as saying they have basic rights as in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We can set goals to help them like the Millennium Development Goals or the Sustainable Development Goals and we can also extend this to non-human animals although that's still very much a work in progress in a sense all of this is a work in progress the 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 rhetoric we accept for universal human rights but we don't necessarily act in the way that we would if we regarded all humans as equal so so it is still something we we struggle with but i think we have made a lot of progress over the last few hundred years in recognizing this and to some extent acting on it. So as I understand it, there is altruism and then there is effective altruism. And in the 2015 book, The Most Good You Can Do, you argued that the principle or the idea of effective altruism is built on a simple and yet an unsettling idea that living a fully ethical life involves doing the most good you can do. And returning to something that we started this discussion with, could you please help me and my listeners better understand what you mean by effective altruism? One of the interesting things about altruism as people practice it today, and some of that altruism, for example, is donating to charities, is that people don't apply the same standard to their charitable donations that they apply to their self-interested purchases. So if you're setting out to buy a new phone or perhaps a car or a laptop, most people will do some research, look online, see which are the ones that get the most stars, see what they can afford to buy, uh, or they may talk to friends. And uh, you know, if they go and go out and buy something and then somebody says, oh, you could have got a better one for half the price, they'll kick themselves and say, oh, that was stupid. I must be more careful next time. But when people donate to charities, very few people do that. Very few people say, is this the charity that will get do the most good for the amount of money that I'm about to donate to it? Or are there other charities that would do twice as much good for half the money that I'm donating? And in fact, the answer is yes. And the answer is that the difference between, not, not put, put aside charities that are just scams or frauds. There are a few of them, but, but most of them are not. But the difference between just an average charity and a really good charity is likely to be much larger than the difference between the best value laptop and the average value laptop. Because if there was a huge difference between those two, the manufacturers of the average value laptop would be out of business. Everybody would work out which to buy. But with charities, because they don't really check that and don't do the research, and it's been harder in the past at least to do that research, the difference between what you get for your charity, for your charitable dollar, might actually be you know, not just twice or four times, but tens or hundreds of times. Let me, let me give you an example that I quote for that. Most people think that a, a good charity is contributing to provide guide dogs for blind people. Many people, you walk through an airport and you see these big plastic dogs with a slot, so you drop some money through the slot and you think, great, I've done something good here. And look, in, you know, you have. I'm not saying that these are bad charities. They're certainly not scams. And giving a blind person a guide dog can help them to get around. But it's costly. Um, it's costly because you need expert trainers of the dogs to get them to work well and then to train the people to work with the dogs and it might cost for example 40,000 US dollars to train one guide dog and one person get them to work together now compare that with what it costs to restore sight in somebody who is blind because they have cataracts you're in Norway I'm in Australia we don't have to worry if we get cataracts we've got a government paid healthcare system that will remove them for us but Many people in the world don't live in countries that do that. And so as they get older and get cataracts, they're blind and they can't afford to see. There are also other people who are blind because they were not treated for trachoma when they were young. Trachoma is the biggest cause of preventable blindness. And that's an inexpensive treatment that uh, they could have been given. So I think it's clearly you know, better to not be blind when you either were blind or would be blind 
And I think the difference between being blind and not blind is bigger than the difference between being blind and having a guide dog and being blind and not having a guide dog. But the cost, you know, might be just $100, say, for restoring sight in somebody who has cataracts or preventing somebody going blind from trachoma. So that means that for $40,000, you could restore sight or prevent blindness in 100 people. And so it's at least 100 times as good to give to those organizations that are effectively doing that as it is to give to those that are providing guide dogs. You know, I'd say more than 100 times because the difference is, is bigger. I want to return to the article that in many ways shaped my first field work in India when I was studying starvation deaths. I mentioned this to you earlier, the article from 1972. I think it was one of your first articles, Famine, Affluence and Morality, where you have an example that has become extremely well known, not just in philosophy, but also in other circles. It's one of us walking past a shallow pond and we see a child drowning in it. Rather than me explaining that example, perhaps you can for the umpteenth time explain or just describe that example and how you draw some of the principles of charity, of altruism, of our ability to combat world suffering from that. So the shallow pond example, Peter, for the umpteenth time, Right. This is like asking the Rolling Stones to sing Satisfaction once more. I Indeed. <laughs> but they do it, so I can do it. Um, so yes, you one day when you're going somewhere, meeting some important people, so you've, you've got your finest clothes on, uh, you take a shortcut cut across a park, and in the park there's a pond. You're familiar with the park and the pond, and in, you know that the pond is quite shallow because in summer you've seen children playing in it and they can stand. It's kind of waist deep on a teenager. But now it's winter, there's nobody playing in the pond. You don't expect to see anyone or anything in the pond, but you do notice that there is in fact something in the pond and something splashing in the pond. And when you look closer, you see it's, it's, it's a really small child, just a toddler who can't stand even in that shallow pond. And of course, you would say this, this child is, is gonna drown. This child is too small to be able to swim. Uh, what's going on here? Where's the child's uh, parents or babysitter? But there's nobody there. You don't know how this has occurred, but there's only you and the child. And if you don't get into that pond really fast and pull the child out, the child is going to drown. So I think most people would think, oh, I've got to do that and start hurrying towards the pond. But suppose you have a second thought, not so noble. That is, gee, but I've got these really good clothes on. They cost me quite a lot. They're going to get ruined if I jump into that shallow pond. The child isn't my child, and I'm not responsible in any way for it. Nobody even asked me to keep an eye on the child. So why don't I just forget that I ever saw the child? Probably the child will drown, but I won't be up for the cost of replacing my expensive clothes. You know, that's the story I tell. And then I usually ask the audience, so what would you think about a person who did that? Would you think that was okay? Or would you think that was wrong? And most people say, that's very wrong. You'd have to be a kind of a monster to put, to put you know, saving your clothes from getting ruined above uh, the life of a child. So I say, good, I, I agree with that. And I'm glad you think uh, that way. But think about your situation now. Um, you probably have spent some money on expensive clothes or if clothes are not your thing, maybe you upgraded your phone when you didn't need to or nice car that you didn't need, whatever, whatever it might be. And you live in a world in which there are children who are dying, not necessarily from drowning, but they might be dying from malaria, which could be prevented by distributing bed nets in malaria prone regions, or perhaps they get diarrhea, which could be prevented by having paramedics distribute oral rehydration therapy and train villages in how to use it for kids who get diarrhea, or by improving their sanitation, you know, a whole host of things. So are you doing that? If you're not doing that, is your way of living that different from that of the person who didn't want to go to the expense of replacing their clothes and was prepared to let a child drown in order to avoid going to that expense. Now, it's true that emotionally it's different. You don't see the child in front of you. It's easier to ignore children who you can read about or maybe see in a video online, but, um, but they're not in front of you. And you could say, I'm just doing what everyone else does. You know, I'm, I'm nothing special about me or especially bad about me. But, but once you realize this, once you know about it, 
then I don't think the fact that the child is not in front of you makes a significant moral difference. I don't think the fact that the child is, is in a faraway country makes a difference. Yes, you, you have to donate to a charity. You do have to find out that this is an effective charity, but it's not hard to do that online. Perhaps you, know, you could say there's some chance that the charity won't do the right thing, even though it seems to be a good one. So yes, maybe the probability that you will save a life is not 100%, whereas you could say in the case of the drowning child in the pond, it was 100% or very close to it. But still, you know, I mean, there's quite a high probability that by donating to an effective charity, you will save a life. Or as I said, you might restore sight in somebody or do other good things. So I think our situation is not that different from the person who looks away from the child and goes on the, the passerby. Uh, and, and that's the point I'm trying to make with that example. I've used this article in several of my courses on, on the politics of poverty, and we've had fascinating discussions with students on this because the essence of consequentialism, as I understand it, is, is that right action by us will lead to good results. Yes. And in the article, you talk about two main principles. One, the first principle is that suffering and death from lack of food, shelter, medical care, any sort of suffering of that kind is bad. And then you have the second principle. There's a strong and a weak version of it. The strong version, of course, is that if it is in our part to prevent something bad from happening without thereby sacrificing anything of comparable moral importance, we ought morally to do it. And a weaker version of this, you, of course, say, if it is in our part to prevent something very bad from happening without sacrificing anything morally significant, we ought morally to do it. Now, in the latest edition of your book, The Life You Can Save, How to Do Your Part to End World Poverty, you also actually adopt a slightly different formulation. You say that we should be giving a lot of money, donating to effective charities that can prevent suffering without sacrificing anything nearly as important. And I've heard you say this before, that this formulation nearly as important is on purpose vague. The question is, why is it vague? Well, it's, I think the different, I mean, there are various differences, obviously, between things that are written almost 50 years apart. Um, <laughs> you know, you, you might say one was written by a young idealist and the other was, was written by an older, you know, realist um, who'd become just a little less idealist about how people might behave. So that would be part of it. Uh, another difference is that one was written for a philosophy journal. The article was published in Philosophy and Public Affairs, then a new peer-reviewed philosophy journal, but uh, and, and now a very well-established and well-regarded one. And The Life You Can Save was written for a broader audience. Uh, it was originally published by uh, Random House, major trade publisher. Then, as a result of the publication of that book in 2009, an organization called The Life You Can Save sprang up. Uh, essentially, I co-founded it with Charlie Bressler, who was the founding president of it. And Charlie had the idea that we should buy the rights to the book back from Random House, which they did agree to sell us, and make the book available free online to whoever wanted it. And so as part of that, I updated it. So for the 10th anniversary edition of 2019, and it is now available free online, either as an ebook or an audio book from thelifeyoucansave.org. So given that I was writing for this broader audience, I wanted, and perhaps given that I'd become older and a little more realistic, <laughs> um, I wanted to get the largest possible number of people to do something. I, I wanted to avoid the idea that people would say, well, this is this principle is just too demanding. If you know, if that's what it takes to live an ethical life, I've got to give up on ethics. So to avoid that, I did make the principle rather vague, as you say, by using that, you know, not sacrificing anything nearly as bad. Um, and I wanted people to 
think for themselves then about, well, what do I regard as nearly as bad? But I hope that most people would recognize that for something to be not nearly as bad as, you know, that it's fairly easy for something to be not nearly as bad as allowing a child to die or even um, allowing people to become blind when they don't have to. So I wanted people to be honest with themselves and to say, yes, well, if I don't spend this money on whatever it was going to be, that new phone or maybe a holiday that I was going to have, traveling somewhere exotic, yeah, that's that's a bit bad for me, you know, um, would be nice to have those things, but not nearly as bad as what will happen to the people if I don't donate the money. So I think there's still, you can I can use that somewhat loose phrase, and if people are honest, they'll still say, I really ought to be giving a lot more than I'm giving now. And they will see that they can give a lot more, and they're not making a huge sacrifice, but they're in fact doing something that is fulfilling and meaningful. Uh, and so that was the thought. I really wanted to get more people doing something. This is why it's so fascinating to speak with you today, because when I read the article and the original article 72 piece, you were writing at a time when uh, Bangladesh was suffering from famine, lots of people were dying, and you were almost like doing what the Beatles were doing, but in, you were the academic rock star then. But some of the criticism, of course, at that point, Peter, if I if I can paraphrase, was that doing what you were advocating for people to do, you know, give as much as possible, was there was this requirement of heroic sacrifice. There was this overload of obligations. How, how would we know what to do, who to help? We have all of these other responsibilities to our family, to our neighborhood, to our, to our country. How would we know that these things would be effective? Those were the initial sort of comments. And then there were, of course, other much more polarizing views Garrett Hardin being in case saying basically it's all, you know, lifeboat ethics. And in a way, I'm, I'm sure some of President Trump's rhetoric comes out a bit like that, right? I mean, it's the national interest. We are all in these lifeboats. We should be taking care of ourselves. So it seems to me, Peter, that the initial response to that academic article seemed to be focusing on this overload of obligations, whereas your latest work is basically saying you don't have to, there's a giving pledge, you don't have to give everything, but you can give quite a lot and yet maintain a good life. Have I understood you correctly? Mm. Yes, no, I think you've, you've understood that quite correctly. I would just pick up one thing you said. I, I would distinguish Garrett Hardin and Donald Trump fairly sharply. Um, I mean, I disagree with them both, but, but Hardin at least was taking a global point of view. Hardin's view was some countries there's no point in helping because it's just going to mean that their population expands and they'll be starving again in 20 years, but there'll be a larger number of people starving. Fortunately, Hardin was wrong on the facts, right? I mean, he, he, Bangladesh was one of his examples of a, a basket yeah. case. We shouldn't help Bangladesh. And the population of Bangladesh is now larger than when Hardin was writing. I think it was in the early 80s, significantly larger. And it's a huge success story now. But exactly, Bangladesh. exactly. The, you know, people are not starving in Bangladesh now. So, so he was wrong on the facts, but he was, I suppose, in some sense thinking, well, what is the best thing to do for all of those affected and for the future as well as the present? Whereas Trump, I don't think, gives a damn about people in Bangladesh or or outside America at all, as far as I can see. I mean, his thing was, we want to make America great again. It's an America first policy, you know. So he was not taking the point of view of the universe. He was taking the point of view of Americans and perhaps just trying to appeal to the self-interest of those who can vote, because of course it's Americans who vote in those elections where he was elected in 2016, and it's not the people of Bangladesh or anywhere else in the world. So I, I see him as not thinking ethically at all, just thinking from a self-interested perspective, whereas I see Hardin as attempting to think ethically, but being somewhat careless about the facts that he was alleging. You know, some of these debates from the 70s, Peter, of course, have resurfaced these days because of climate change. So you have a lot of neo-Malthusians saying, 
Africa is going to be a big problem when they end up consuming so much as we do, and we should be thinking about population control. I think Paul Ehrlich, even a couple of years ago, said that he still believes that population is a problem, even though, as you say, that we realize that there is enough food. It is more sort of a distribution issue. But one point I wanted to ask you, which goes a bit back to the Trump argument, perhaps, is the diffusion of responsibility. Some people say it's better for local elites out there in these countries to know what's best for their people. They should be doing more. Why should it be us? Well, I certainly think that we should uh, respect local knowledge and uh, we shouldn't just go in and say, you know, we're, we're the white people, we know what's best. Often we don't. And there's plenty of examples where we've messed things up. That's true. But firstly, local elites, even if they're well-intentioned, may not have the resources to really help people in, in, the, in their countries, in countries that themselves are not resource-rich. And secondly, of course, sadly, there are some countries that have elites that are simply looking after themselves too. <laughs> too much. I, yeah, too much, yeah. Um, and I don't think you know, we're relieved of the obligation to assist simply because they're not doing what they should be doing. So I think that we need to be careful. We need to enlist local people and uh, we certainly don't want to force things on them. But the fact is that we have the ability to help to an extent that uh, very often the local people don't. And that's what we should be doing. So in the book, of course, you raise some of the typical objections to your argument. One is this futility that we end up saving lives, but we want to perhaps focus more on the proportion than the actual numbers that we are hung up on percentages when the cost of saving each group maybe is the same. Others would say the sense of fairness. If we feel that we're doing more than our fair share, then we end up not helping. Another line of thinking, especially coming from libertarians in the United States, is that, oh, don't tell me what to do. I know what's best for me. You're constraining my freedom, etc. So how do you see this act of giving? Is it a matter of positive rights and duties more than the emphasis on negative rights and duties that often is the focus of libertarians and many others in the United States, for example? Yes, well, interestingly, I think the, the libertarian position, which seems in theory to be quite strong, that uh, as long as I don't harm others, I don't have any responsibilities or owe them anything, that's really undermined now by climate change. Because by continuing to live the way we do, adding to greenhouse gas emissions at a, at a rate that per capita is many times that of people living in low-income countries, we are harming these people. So even if you just say we mustn't harm people or if we do harm them, we must compensate them for the harm we've done, we should be doing a lot for people in low-income countries. So even the libertarians, really, if they're honest, should be committed to that. So are we saying then that we are complicit, that we've actually caused and therefore... We are causing, yes. We have caused um, and, and we are causing harm because we are. It's very hard. I mean, it's possible, you know, you could you could get off the grid and have solar power and for all of your energy and something like that. But otherwise, if you're if you're living in the midst of a major city, it's it's really very hard to not be putting out more greenhouse gas emissions than people in some of the low-income countries in the world, and they're the people most vulnerable to climate change because many of those countries are in hot, fairly dry places. They're dependent on rainfall for, you know, they're just growing to feed themselves. You know, for example, this is, this is very relevant for the Indian subcontinent because there are climate models that suggest that we're going to weaken uh, the monsoon, which so many hundreds of millions of people rely on to produce their food. So I think that we, we are complicit in this and we are continuing to contribute to it. So even if I were a libertarian, which I'm not, I would think that I ought to be helping people to get out of this situation. As you know, we said at the beginning of this discussion, I'm, I'm more of a consequentialist, like a utilitarian. I think that we ought to be minimizing suffering and doing good. And I don't hold with the idea that as long as we don't harm any anyone else, that's 
that's fine. I think we should be helping people. So I, I reject that on philosophical grounds as well as on the, the empirical claims that I just made about the, the harm that we're doing. But we need to do that in the best possible way, and that will involve helping people locally, you know, asking them what they want, what they feel they need, asking them how we can make a big difference to them. And uh, in some cases, perhaps just giving them cash and seeing what they can do with it. And one of the uh, effective organizations that The Life You Can Save recommends is Give Directly, which is an organization that is relatively new, but started out with this bold idea that we should just give people cash and we should see what they do with it. And they did that and they followed up and uh, no, they didn't spend it all on on alcohol or gambling or prostitution. They actually used it in pretty sensible ways in accordance with how they perceived their needs. And some people started small businesses with it and worked themselves out of poverty. Other people just ate better or were able to educate their children, replace their thatched roof with a corrugated iron one so that they don't get wet. And in the long run, they save money because the roof lasts so much longer. So, you know, you can be, you, you don't have to be paternalistic. You can just make that offer. You can say, well, look, I'm fortunate, you know, to me, let's say a thousand dollars isn't a vast sum. It's not going to make a huge difference to my life if I have a thousand dollars left. But you're somebody living on the World Bank's two dollars a day borderline for extreme poverty or less than that. So for you, a thousand dollars is more than your whole annual income. And that will enable you to do these things that I've just mentioned. So no, I don't want to be paternalistic. I'll just give you the cash. Yeah, the cash transfer thing is, of course, now well established in the development discourse as having worked really well. And as you also refer to in your latest, the latest edition of your of your book, that universal basic income is also another idea that is gaining a lot of attention. Just a final set of issues. One has to do with the distinction you sometimes make between charity and duty. And I wonder sometimes whether when we talk about charity or giving to charities, we are perhaps praising people for giving, but we don't usually condemn people for not being generous. So generosity is praised, being stingy, it's fine, you're not really criticized, as opposed to framing this more in relation to human rights, obligations, duties. How do you see that charity duty linkage? Yes, I, I mean, I do use the term charity, but I don't use it in the sense that some moralists do, where they regard charity as something that is optional, but it's good to do, but, but not wrong not to do. I think that if you are comfortably off, you know, middle class or above in an affluent society, and you're not doing anything to help people who, through no fault of their own, are living in extreme poverty, that's wrong. So in, in that sense, I would say it is a duty to help. So, and, and one way of helping is by giving to organizations that we call charities, because you know, to get tax deductibility, say in the United States, you need to be recognized as a charity. So that, that term is there and we're not gonna get away from it, but I'm not using it in the sense of saying uh, charity is something that's good to do, but not wrong not to do. I think depending on your economic position, it can be wrong not to do it. It can mean that you're not living an ethical life. So how can we create a culture of giving? How can we, as you put it in the book, give people the right kind of nudge? In the book, of course, you talk about a giving scale, a certain percentage of income that we all ought to be contributing. How can we create that kind of culture of contribution? Well, I would like to, certainly. I would like to create a culture in which People feel that they should be giving something significant, larger proportions of their income as they have more income, of course. And the organization, The Life You Can Save, that as I said, I, I co-founded, does set out to do that. I mean, its, it's primary task is to offer a list of charities that are independently assessed as being highly effective, but it is also trying to spread the idea that giving is something you can do, that is a rewarding thing to do, but also ultimately in the last resort, that if you're economically secure, that you ought to be doing. Peter, it was fantastic to see you. Thank you so much for coming on my show today. Thanks, Dan. It's been a pleasure talking to you.
If you enjoyed this podcast, please spread the news among your friends and share it on social media. The Twitter handle for this podcast is Global Dev Pod. Thank you for listening to In Pursuit of Development with Professor Dan Bannock from the University of Oslo Center for Development and the Environment. Please email your questions, comments, and suggestions to inpursuitofdevelopment at gmail.com.